Today's title, Day by Day. Day by Day. Yep. We got to take it day by day. Don't you love all the plans and all these grandiose things we're going to do and how great everything's going to be? And sometimes we just got to take it day by day. You ever hear that, that one country song, I breathe in and I breathe out? I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just trying to keep on moving. So I want to get us to a place that understanding that obviously Adam and Eve made a big mistake. But I say it, and I mean it with all my heart. If I would have been Adam, I'd have done the same thing more than likely, right? Because we have sin nature in us. And I'd love to say, well, those guys made these sins. It's like the people complaining. or I, I can't even tell you how many stories I've heard about people talking about the Israelites. Well, God was taking care of them and blah, 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 blah. And he's giving them manna and they're complaining. And they're going, well, you wander in a desert for 40 years and eat manna every day. No Chick-fil-A, no Chipotle, no McDonald's. I complain too. It's got to be terrible, right? But we want to act like we, we've got this righteousness about us that we wouldn't feel that way. But the fact of the matter is, is we are a byproduct of sin nature and sin in this world. It just is what it is. And because of that, sin started to happen. And not only did Adam and Eve sin, but then their first set of kids. Can you imagine two brothers? And they really fought. And they fought hard, right? And Cain ends up killing Abel, right? That's a, that, that's a major catastrophe in their family. I'm only sure of it, right? But they have now a curse. Adam and Eve have a curse because of what they've done. And that curse is carrying out through the generations. So it says in Genesis chapter 3, verses 16 through 19, it says, after God was a little upset, called Adam and Eve out, he said, then he said to the woman, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy. Any woman not experienced pain in childbirth? Sounds like pretty legit, huh? And in pain, you will give birth. And you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. And to the man, he said, listen to this, guys. Women, childbirth. Okay, got it. Guys, a bunch more. He says, since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree, whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. All your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it. Have any of you had a struggle? Any of you <laughs> had a, oh, oh, well, I can tell you where the prophecy's from, right? It, and here it says, all your life you're going to struggle. It will grow thorns and thistles for you, though you will eat of its grain. So guess what? You're going to enjoy the earth, but you're always going to have the stickers. Yes, we have goat heads. We have sand burrs, cockle burrs, right? Don't we enjoy that? And even in our yard, you know, I tell you, our garden was so beautiful until the rattlesnake was in it. <laughs> then everything changes, right? You start to go, oh, I'm not sticking my hand in the tomato plant. I'm in there with my boots. <laughs> and then I'll check it, right? Because I want to make sure I'm going to be okay, right? But we are a product of this curse. Now listen to this. It goes on to say, it will grow thorns and thistles for you. I can show you where they're at in my fields, Right? And there are pain in the hind end, right? And then, and then it continues. Though you will eat of its grains, by the sweat of your brow will you have food to eat. You know what that means? You're going to work for it. It's going to be hard. It's going to be stressful. It's going to be difficult until you return to the ground. Guess what? It's a promise. You get this the rest of your life. Maybe you're like, oh, thank you, Reverend Killjoy. But the fact of the matter is this is really important for us to put it all in perspective because you can't take it day by day until you can look at it in perspective. And he says, from which you were made, right? For you were made from dust, and to dust you will return. That's what it says. That's what it means. So we have 
all of these trials and frustrations and sadness and it feels like we start to make progress and then the car breaks down and then we make progress and then the toilet backs up and then we make progress and somebody at work is causing our lives to be difficult and you just feel all of the thorns, all of the thistles, all of the difficulties in life. Well, it's part of God's promise and it's never going to stop. But your part is, what are you going to do with it? What do they say? You make lemonade out of lemons? You get something, and you have to make something from it. You know, we went to the state fair, watched the kids' 4-H stuff, and look at all these, and this kid made a table out of all these old junk gears, and it was one of the coolest things. And <laughs> Bree, I say, I could have this in the house. Bree's like, we will not have something like that in our house. But nonetheless, yeah, I thought it was cool, right? They had all these gears fitting together from every kind of machine you've ever seen. And they welded this whole thing together. It was a coffee table, must have been 600 pounds. But I thought, man, that is awesome, right? That's cool. They took something that was junk to everybody else. And they made something from it. And our call, our job in our life is to do something with what we have day by day. You can't fix tomorrow. You can't fix everything in the future. You don't know what everything else is going to be. But today, you can make it happen, right? It says, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Why is that so important? Because we need to make today matter. We need to make today count. And so I think about all of the different little things that come our way, and how do you do that, and how do you enjoy that? My grandparents, they had money. They were not broke. But my grandpa was not going to spend $3,000 to fix the sewer line because that was way too much money. And that was 40 years ago, right? He wasn't going to spend that money. And so he's like, that is ridiculous. I will get out there and I'm going to dig this up. So he dug up a corner in his house, outside of his house and went, oh, it's too much work. And he stopped, right? But what he did was he managed to take his, the old clay pipes, you know. He managed to chip it out with a hammer. And so when everything backed up, he had a couple of different sets of ba uh, barbed wire that he had that he'd fish in there get that thing a going, and then everything would set up, and it would be freed again, and all the stink fish went on their way, and Grandpa was happy, and he'd go back in the house. And he left that sewer that way for years. All of my childhood, I knew. Oh, the sewer's starting to back up, and Grandpa would go out there, and he'd fish that thing out and go back, because that was cheaper than the 3000 bucks. He never kept track of inflation, right? And then I get married, and Grandpa still has not fixed the sewer, I'm an adult. Grandpa still has not fixed the sewer, and not a big deal, not a big deal. He's like, we got this taken care of. It's not, not a problem, and uh, it still backs up. He starts getting estimates. Now they want 16000 I'll never pay it over my dead body. I am not spending that kind of money for a sewer, and he wouldn't. So by some time, my grandma had died, and Bree is helping uh, my grandpa kind of tidy up the house. And she's washing bedding, and she's washing rugs and all of this stuff, and all of a sudden, sewer backs up. Not a problem. It's dark. We're going to go out there and take care of it. My grandpa gives me rubber gloves for hygiene, okay? So I put on these big old rubber gloves that go up to my elbows. He gives me this lantern light, you know? So I have to crawl down in the hole that he made some 30 years ago, and it's still there, you know? I get down in the hole, and I turn on the flashlight, and I, he's giving me the different wires, because now he's getting a little bit more. He's not able to get down there. I think he was even on oxygen at the time, so he couldn't even get down there with this tank and everything else. To free. So I'm down there, and I'm taking care of business and, you know, getting things to get going, but something came up, and I tried to move the light because Grandpa wasn't holding it right, but I forgot that I had been holding some stink fish, you know, and, you know, I got all that stuff done, and then all of a sudden... Grandpa grabs the light, and he just goes, whoa, you know, and he opens his hand. Oh, I got to go wash my hands 20 times, you know, because there's unintended consequences. Now, he got to experience the joy of not dealing with this sewer, 
And he totally could have. I mean, the money was in the bank. He didn't want to spend it. Didn't want to do it. Wasn't going to do it. And he got to have the joys of what that experience is like and still making the most of the day, right? Now, he was very concerned about bacteria. He was very concerned about germs. He went in and he washed his hands and he wiped them off and dried them. And then he washed them again and wiped them off. Then went and got a different soap and he washed them off. I should have just poured Clorox on him, but I did, you know, whatever. The, the fact of the matter is, is he's making the most of the moment. Did that ruin our night? Did that ruin the rest of the week? Did that ruin our time together forever? No. We dropped it at that, and we went on. How can we do that in our everyday lives? How can we do that when so many things are constantly attacking us, and we feel all of the frustrations? How do you get to the place where you say, well, I don't care about tomorrow. I have to enjoy today. It can't fix tomorrow. I can't fix what's happening next week. I can't fix what happens in two years. But what I can do is fix today. I can be joyful today. I can choose to be present with my kids, my spouse, my relatives, whatever it is. I can choose to engage. I can choose to have fun. You ever been so down? Somebody's like, hey, you want to play a game of cards? You're like, yeah, no. No, I don't, no, I don't want to. Hey, do you want to, you know, go to a movie? No, no, I don't want to. Hey, do you want to go sit something to eat? No, I'd rather starve. I it just, right? Because we get so many attacks from the devil that we get to the place where we're sitting there going, I, I, I just don't want to do more. And that's exactly what the devil wants. Think of him on his little chair in his chuckle box just laughing. See, I got you to the place that you didn't enjoy today. You know, we deal with a lot of people that were suffering from chemical dependency, all sorts of addictions. And the biggest thing that we would do to work with those folks is day by day. We can't guarantee you won't have a struggle in a week, a month, or whatever. But how about today? How are you doing today? How do we get you through today so you don't have those problems? And that's where we want to be in our lives. So I talk about all that to say, Cain. He's a product of his parents' sin. And five generations later, they're living life, right, in Cain's life. And if you look at Genesis chapter 4, I want you to hear this, because I want you to pull out this extrapolation. So Genesis 4, 17, it says, Cain had sexual relations with his wife. She became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Then Cain founded a city, which he named Enoch after his son. Enoch had a son named Irad. Now you're going, here's the begats, but hey, sit tight. It's going to get good. You got to see, you got to hear the begats to understand the whole picture. And Irad became the father of Mahujael. Mahujael became the father of Methushael. Methushael became the father of Lamech. Lamech married two women. The first was Ada and the second was Zillah. Ada gave birth to Jabel, who was the first of those who raised livestock and live in tents. Five generations of the battles, and they finally figured out how to start living in tents and raising livestock for a system, right? Verse 21, his brother's name was Jubal, the first of all who play the harp and flute. This is the first time there's a mention of these people starting to make instruments, people starting to progress, right? And Lamech's other wife, Zillah, gave birth to a son named Tubal Cain. He became an expert in forging tools of bronze and iron. And Tubal Cain had a sister named Nama. So you're like, what is this? What's the concept of this passage? Five generations, they toil after great, 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 great grandpa and grandma make a sin, right? And now they're progressing. And they're able to start making tools. They're able to start making things easier. Now look at it. I talk about my grandpa not wanting to part with that money for the sewer. Because my grandpa grew up with an outhouse. My grandpa never went to high school. Right? My grandpa never went to college. Right? And he lived a life in his day 
and he toiled, and he worked through things. It was monumental to give him a cell phone a few years before he died, to have him using a cell phone, which he just could not believe. He just, I just, it's amazing this thing works, you know, and he'd really do it all special because he really had to push the buttons well or whatever. But the, the fact of the matter is, is his life was a very of hard, right? And then they worked with things, and they progressed. Why am I telling you this? Because God gives us the grace within the battle. God gives us the grace within the curse. It's a curse. We're always going to toil and we're always going to work hard. But now we have paint sprayers and we have pneumatic nailers and we have excavators and we have also, we have heaters, wash machines, dryers, microwaves. I remember we got our first microwave when I was a kid. Took up almost the whole back seat. My brother and I over there sitting by each other. That's when you didn't have to be in seat belts either, right? You know, we're sitting over there, mom and dad are hauling this microwave in the car, right? This is a big epic moment. We got this big old giant thing the size of the oven so we can microwave chicken to make it taste great. Just fast, you know, right? When we look at all these progresses, look what has happened. And so I want you to look at in your own life, in your day, when you're all frustrated about all of these other battles, the wasp stung me, I got bit by a rattlesnake, I have this trial, I have that battle, and start to look at the progress you've made in your everyday life and say, what do I have? Where am I at? What has God blessed me with? And I'm going to enjoy that because I have somebody beside me saying, I want to play cards with you. Somebody saying, hey, I want to go do this or I want, and you're sitting there, oh, I just don't feel like it, I just can't. And instead, you go, no, I want to engage because this is what I have. And I don't know how much longer I'm going to have that person beside me. Right? My grandpa's gone on and died. That's happened 10 years ago or better. I don't know. It's been a while. So has it been that long? Okay. Time flies when you're having fun, I guess. But the fact of the matter is I still treasure the moments that I got to have for him, right, with him. Are you giving those moments to your friends and family and your loved ones? Or are you letting the attacks that the devil's given to you hold you back from enjoying everyday life? So we have to live day by day, absolutely. We have to enjoy the day. We have to live during the day. I forgot to tell you guys what point number one was. Got all distracted. So regardless of life's work, there's progress. Hope for it to be better. That's point number one. Regardless of life's work, there's progress. We saw Life's work, we saw progress in five generations after Adam. They started making tools. And guys have loved tools ever since. Right? We need tools. Like, now we are generations since Adam, and it's no longer a, a thing that sometimes you know. You have to have a tool. You just have to. That's just the way the world is. But point is, is there's progress. And point number two is live during the day. And so we need to look at Psalm 118, 24, right? This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. If you don't have that somewhere, put it somewhere. You need to be looking at that every day. When all of a sudden you're upset and you're down and you're depressed and the devil's attacking you and there's a hundred things. Every one of you, if I sat down and started writing a list, you could fill a page for me of the attacks because we're all going to have them. It's part of how this world works. But we got to be able to say, no, this is the day the Lord's made. I'm going to rejoice. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 34, this is a sermon on the mount. He said, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble enough for today. <laughs> and don't you ever feel like that where you're like, oh, it's enough just to get through today. I can't even think about tomorrow. I've had moments, my schedule still to this day, so busy in my schedule, I can't even look at what tomorrow is or I will mess up today because it just overwhelms me with all the stuff that I have to get done and all of the things I'm trying to do. And I'm trying to cut back and I'm trying to cut out just like all of you. We all know that everybody's like trying to get there. But it's still hard. And we've got to be in the place where we can say, no, 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 I'm going to enjoy today. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 says, work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the word of truth. But the key in there is be a good worker. Be a good worker. We have to work. That's the way it is. That's the way it's designed, and it's never going to stop. So just be a good worker. 
And don't let it overwhelm you. And don't let it upset you. And don't let it take your joy away from the things that we're supposed to enjoy and the fun we're supposed to have in life. Because if you can't take it day by day, you miss out on day after day. And we want to be at a place where we can take it day by day and actually enjoy everything that God is bringing before us because we know the devil's always going to attack. But can we enjoy ourselves right where we're at? Can we enjoy everything that we have? You know, you see little kids, and when we were little kids, my brother and I, we, we didn't have a lot of toys, and we loved to play out in the dirt with our little tractors and stuff like that. And we, but we didn't have all the money for all the little implements we needed to pull in the dirt. We, we needed to make lines. And before you knew it, we were using little nails and wire and anything we could find to pull behind our tractor so it would look like a field. We made something out of nothing. Our moments together need to be something. There need to be sustenance that we can continue to encourage each other, that we can fellowship, that we can grow. And the same thing at work. We need to be working and doing as unto the Lord, right? Oh, that brings me to the next one, right? But Proverbs twenty two twenty nine says, do you see any truly competent workers? They will serve kings rather than working for ordinary people. But you know, I've had some conversations about contractors, and I'm like, you know, when you find a really, really good contractor, they're the people that cost big money. And you know why they cost big money? Because they know what they're doing. And they don't mess it up. And they leave a product that you go, wow, thank you for what you've given me, right? And I'm going to tell you, we want to be that person, right? We want to leave a product for everybody else. Our testimony that people go, man, they, they're there. They crank it out. They, they make it happen. They do as unto the Lord. And then Psalm 90:17 it said, And may the Lord our God show us approval and make our efforts successful. Yes, make our efforts successful. We need to be at the place that our efforts are great, that our work product is awesome. And the only way to do that is to take it day by day. Focus on what's important right now. What do I need to be focusing on? How can I enjoy today? What is the best that God has for me with what I have? You know, we always think we have to have some show to make it all perfect and beautiful and wonderful. You see these people spending $80,000 on a wedding and everything else, and I just like, oh, my gosh. I, and I'm not, I, I just, wow. I, I just, is that what it takes to have a special moment? Because I'm going to tell you, I, <laughs> I know too many people that have had wonderful, long-lasting marriages that did not have that big of a show, did not have this grandiose effort, right? But we think we have to have more than we have. And so can we take those moments and enjoy our time together? What are all the studies about people eating dinner? They don't even eat dinner together anymore. It's just here and there and got to go. And What about that moment of the good home cooking? Right? We were just talking about that the other day. We had to eat out somewhere, and we're just like, oh, we wish we could have just ate at home. But we were doing it out of desperation and starvation. And I know it's not quite starvation, but the kids felt like we were there, so we had to get them something, you know. With all, but the fact of the matter is, is what beats at home cooking? And the time that we sit together, laugh together, talk together, even argue together, it happens, right? But that's what part of what grows us together, Right? But that moment is important, and you want to take those ordinary moments, the everyday moments, and enjoy. I look back at the girls and some of the things that they were doing as they were growing up, and I look at those cute little moments, and it was never, oh, remember when we were at this grandiose thing on the trip to Australia, which we never went, right? But I'm just saying, we didn't look at it that way. It was, oh, when they were out playing in the mud, you know, oh, when we were doing this. Oh, remember when we had that, right? Those are the moments, the day-by-days. And we're missing the day-by-days when we let the devil just captivate us and kind of suck us down that hole. And so 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Everything you do, do it all for the glory of God. If you're going to live in day-by-day, you can't fix tomorrow. You can't fix that, you know, the electricity doesn't work or, or that the pipes are broken or that the car's not fixed or that the person at work is terrible to work with. You can't fix it. But don't let that destroy your moment together with your spouse, your family, your kids, or even at work. You want to be able to continue 
to go forward and have that joy that's in your heart. And Colossians 3.23 says, work willingly at whatever you do as though you are working for the Lord rather than people. Have you thought about that? When you're working, am I doing this for the boss or am I doing this for God? I don't care what the boss wants. I'm going to supersede their expectations because I'm doing this. This is a product of what my heavenly father has asked me to do. This is what I'm going to do. And we always think about it. It's always at our work. It's work to be married. It's work to be a parent. It's work to be a friend. Don't forget those moments too. Because all of those moments are important that we do as unto the Lord, that we minister to each other, and that we set the time apart every day to choose to say, this is the day the Lord has made, and I'm going to rejoice in being exceedingly glad. How many times do people say, ah, he got up on the wrong side of the bed? Do you ever just wake up and you're grouchy? I've had these moments. I'm like, what is my deal? Like, why am I like this? I need to, like, figure out how to knock that off, right? More times than not, people start helping me to know that. By saying, hey, you really, you're like, you, you have an attitude, right? And, oh, okay, I'll fix that. I need to do something about it. But I'm going to ruin that day if I don't. And there are going to be some things and some days that you don't want to do. But you do it for others out of love and to glorify Christ. And that will give you more fulfillment than if you just made it through the day, live life, and this is what I'm going to do, and this is how I'm going to do it. And, oh, that's not God's best for you. So live day by day. Will you please stand with me? I want to say a prayer over everybody. Maybe it's just me, but I feel like everybody needs a little help on their day by day sometimes. So, Father God, I just lift up everybody here. We thank you, Lord, that you give us joy. And Father God, I know you had a sense of humor because you made me, and I know I can be a challenge. But Father God, help us. Help us to find your humor in our everyday struggles, in our everyday trials, in our everyday frustrations. Help us, Father God, to seize the moment, to capture day by day everything that you have for us. And when we go to bed at night, we say, I live this day to my fullest. Not, oh, I'm so glad this day is over. We ask you, Father God, help us to be at the place that we can enjoy everything you have for us. And even when the devil attacks us, that we look at and go, oh, is that all you have? Well, nice try. We thank you, Father God, that your favor rests on us, that your anointing continues to rest on us. Fill us with your joy, your hope, your peace, and wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen.